the summer of 2013, the political temperature in Egypt has reached fever pitch. Twelve months after being elected, the army headed by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi prepares to overthrow President Mohamed Morsi and terminate once and for all the revolutionary changes that had brought an end to the autocratic rule of Hosni Mubarak. Protesters for and against President Morsi took to the streets. Thousands supporting democracy and speaking out against the military were rounded up and thrown in jail. No distinction was made. Egyptians, young and old, as well as foreign citizens were put behind bars. One of them was Ibrahim Halawa, an Irish teenager born in Dublin. At the time, he was only 17 years old. The Irish embassy initially assured him and his family he will be on the first plane out, they promised. But that was not so. Instead, he was kept in jail for four years, where he says he was routinely tortured, both physically and psychologically. In October this year, after intense lobbying by his family and friends back home, he was finally released. Now a free man, Ibrahim Halawa talks to Al Jazeera about his incarceration in Egypt's notorious prison system. In, in 2013, in June, I was just finished my exams. I went to, the, I went to Egypt before the coup by a few days. I went to see my extended family because my dad had this annual ritual that we'd go and see extended family over there. So that's really my purpose of why I went there in the very start. Uh, of course, Rabat Square, where the anti-coup was taking place, there's a mall there and there was a cinema there that I was there at with my, a few friends of mine before the coup actually took place and before protests took place. It was two days before it. And then I actually went to Tahrir Square where the pro 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 coup was taking place after. And I actually wanted to have a view of both sides so I can base a fair judgment on both. Uh, I didn't agree with what was going on with Tahrir, with Tahrir Square, basically asking for a president to be overthrown without a ballot box, which for me is not democracy. So uh, bit by bit listening up, uh, I, I, I understood the basics of democracy that any 17-year-old will understand if you explain to him. My friends later on uh, were shot dead in, uh, in the anti-coup uh, protests. Um, two of them were actually very close to me the ones I was with in the cinema, they were shot dead. So that's when I actually started to take place in the protests. Um, it was before Al Fatah Mosque when I was arrested. It was just before that by a week and a half. So this is when I started to get, you know, okay, what's happening? What's what's going on? Um, and I went on stage and I spoke about democracy. And I so, spoke. so you went to Egypt without the intention at all of getting involved in the politics, but because of what happened, that that's what... Pushed yeah. you to because of what happened and if freedom of speech shouldn't no one should die for the freedom of speech so especially when they are t two of my closest friends and they died for such for basically it's a value okay that we value but it was they were innocent and they didn't hold anything that was a threat to the Egyptian government for them to kill okay so tell me how did you end up getting arrested um, I after it by after the Rabah massacre when a lot of people died more people died uh, bodies were burned um, mosques were were burned down as well uh, I went to Al Fatah to um, you know to, this is another mosque this is another from... mosque it's far from it's about I think twenty minutes far away from Rabah Square mm -hmm. because this is where everyone was going down to say this is wrong what happened in Rabah is wrong and it's it's against democracy it's against any human rights it's against every you know every possible human action that that can be taken against another human being so we went down to object to that and we peacefully protested but then the military shot at us uh, open fire and this is when we took refuge in a mosque for 24 hours uh, things got tough in the mosque because we you know they started cutting electricity on us they started cutting um water, food, anything, you know, supplements for us to keep us going. So we went there, we stayed in the mosque for 24 hours. The next day they broke into the mosque and we were arrested with uh, tear gas bullets. And this is when I took a bullet inside the mosque. Uh, my sisters were separated from me. My three of them, Farima, Umayma and Sumaya, were also arrested, but I didn't know they were arrested. So I thought they were dead at the moment. Um, mm. I went to get 
uh, a bandage for my hand from uh, from the ambulance out there but to that for me to get a bandage over my hand I had to lie and say that it was the brotherhood that shot me with with the bullet for me to actually get um, some treatment because I was forced by another officer to say that um, so this is when 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 I really after I got my my treatment I was put in a in a, in a tank and from the, ta the tank in a military tank uh, I was moved to a military prison it was made for you know officers who ran away from the military and um, basically soldiers so it was illegal for us to be held there at the at the very start um, obviously this, you hadn't you hadn't made any phone calls by then there was no lawyer nothing. no 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 lawyer nothing we were asked at the moment that he was only going to take us for five minutes to check on us if we if we had any you know any legal problems with Egypt if we have you know criminal criminal records if we if we broke a visa for instance you had your Irish passport I had my Irish time. passport with me to, yeah because it was my only identity as a seven, 17 year old that, that I had especially in Egypt like so we went to the military camp and I told her I saw my sisters but I only saw Farima and uh, Umayma and this is when I started to cry because usually the three of them are together mm. uh, and Sumaya wasn't there so I said okay she's definitely shot dead from you know the bullets and someone picked her up and brought her to another place because from far away my sisters were crying as well mm. and I was just at the emotion I didn't understand what was going on why are they crying why is Sumaya not there so I started to cry and then the officer took me in and he, he put me beside my sisters and I started to say, explain to him, why are we here? Why, why are we here? He said, oh, you're only going to be here for just a few hours. We're going to check on you again and you'll let go. And then I was put in a cell. My sisters were put in a different place. Um, of course, the separation, I had the fear over my sisters for 24 hour, hours a day, basically, that we're there. And uh, it was just fearful for me that anything could happen to them because all the stories that were going on in Egypt and I couldn't, you know, I didn't know, understand the environment in Egypt for, for three girls to be taken, uh, two girls to be taken away. Later on, Sumaya was brought, brought to them. So that's when I saw Sumaya later on. Um, but I was put in a, a cell that usually it takes, if you pack it, it would take 60 people. We were put 120 people in the cell. Um, Tell me, before, before we get into those conditions, I want to know, as a seventeen-year-old, yeah, and like you said, you you were you were born and raised uh, abroad. Going back to Egypt, what were your thoughts when you were arrested? Did you think that, as the officer said, this would just be for a few hours and you'd be released? That as an Irish citizen, it wouldn't you know you wouldn't be subjected to the same treatment that uh, maybe the Egyptian protesters were 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 being subjected to. What what was going through your head when you were um, first arrested? At the at the moment when I was arrested. When he said where he's going to take us for five minutes, I actually believed he was going to take us for five minutes because I didn't understand that our government will hold someone in prison for no reason. I just the concept of that didn't go into my head because you are proven innocent until you know otherwise until you're proven guilty. So for him to take me longer than you know maybe the day, okay, if he wants to check on me, it's his right if he wants to, as a government to have a security check on me if I'm a threat to the government or not. So basically for him to keep me that long was a shock for me and it was my first time away from my family i was put in with people i don't know um with conditions i don't know in a government i don't know uh, far away from my home so for me to stay there it was very very hard for me and it was very shocking and when was the first time that you received any sort of either legal assistance or consular assistance from the from the irish government when was the first time you saw somebody who could actually represent or help you so actually the what happens what with, with the prosecution system in the start is you get four days and then after the four days if you're presented on a prosecutor and then if he if he renews you he renews you for 15 days so that five minutes went on for the four days so after the four days we discovered okay that the prosecution office is coming but then after he came i didn't have a lawyer i wasn't allowed a lawyer we said we want a lawyer we said can we call the embassy they said no. So they took my Irish passport. They said for me to get further consular visits. So I knew something was going on. It wasn't right because if they need to take my passport and for me to get consular visits in the future, that I'm going to stay here a bit. But I didn't know that it was going to be the 15 days. So I heard that we were renewed, renewed 15 days. So we took four days illegally without being presented on a prosecutor in the very start anyway. So I, after it, by about six days is when I first saw the embassy. They came in for a visit. They said they were going to get us on the first plane back to Ireland because this, the whole system in Egypt is just wrong at the moment. And there's nothing against us proven. So we'll probably be on the, on the next flight to, to Ireland.
Mm. And and we weren't. We moved from another military camp, from one military camp to another military camp. And that's when me and my sisters separated. They went to Al Anatar, which is the the women's prison in Egypt. It's the largest women's prison. And I went to and I stayed in in, the, in that military camp because I was injured, and no prison would take an injured injured person until he's cured because they don't want the responsibility of anything happen to him. So everyone throws the responsibility on each other. So I stayed in that military camp with ten or fifteen other uh, injured uh, injured guys who were with me. And then when 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 were you transferred to prison? I was transferred to prison when the 6th of October uh, protesters were arrested. So we were there in military camp. The rest of the guys went to an actual prison. We stayed there for 50 days. 6th of October came, more prisoners came in from the 6th of October protests. Later on, there were about 300 people, 400 people. We moved to Al Marg prison, which is uh, in, in Egypt, in Al Marg as well. It, um, we were we went in there and we were beaten of course and tell me what what happened explain to me the condition when you were transferred to prison what happened there the there are stories of um what they call welcoming parties so, so tell us a little more, more it's about called that. it's called the welcoming party what happens is we are of course we are put into you know the convoy car, cars as well the big metal ones we were we were we were put it takes about 30 full we were again we were put about the double 60 63 people in there a lot of people were fainting a lot of people were losing conscious uh, and you know some had heart problems some were old people so we were scared and actual actually people start dying so we were banging on the cars like hello take at least the injured people or the sick people or, or treat them but no no one answered us so the door was open uh, very fast it said come on come on down 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 and then we were brought down to the door of the prison we're going in you would they have that any any bar that they can get into their hand you're beaten with that one strike just to, just as a count so it'd be like 56 57 that's one bar uh, and then you go in you're told to strip your clothes totally off you take your clothes off uh, they take all your equipment all your belongings and they they set them on fire they burn them and then you have this very long passageway which to you it's a passageway that you think it will not end at all um it's basically soldiers on the right and on the left and they all have a weapon of some sort a whip uh, a bar a metal chain um anything they can get into their hand even if it's as simple as a stone they will throw at you and you have to start running through that while you're running through that everything is coming down at you um and then you reach the end that of course everyone's trying to hold on to you uh, someone's trying to get cover off you so and this all of this you're naked all of this you're naked yeah you have to start running and start running until you reach the other end when you reach the other end you're presented in front of the officer you have to face the ground not eye eyeball the officer at all i just want to say that entering a prison in egypt it's the same for everyone with the welcome party it's so something for a 17 year old irish kid to go through something like this you you you've just described both physical and psychological torture, and that starts off the bat from the from yeah. the moment you enter. Yeah, it's from the it's from the very start. You, they don't even check your age. So if they if they would have checked my age, they would have found I was a seventeen year old as a minor. So I wouldn't even be allowed in this prison in the start. Hmm. I should have been sent, you know, sent back to 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 the military camps so I can be released because I'm under age. But then of course they didn't even check papers, so I was taken to a cell straight away with with any normal person who was who was the same age as me anyone who's older per, older or so i was taken to a cell but it was very frightening for me because why is this all happening to me i am innocent when and the minute i entered the prison doors i knew i was going to stay longer i was put in a cell no electricity no uh, no windows um no ventilation um the door didn't open at all until they just opened to give you your food and they closed it straight away um it was it was basically closed but every day 7 a.m i would wake up to the noise of screaming and torture i didn't know where it was what it was coming from but there was about at least 30 individual men screaming like like so hard screaming from torture um, later on, I discovered that they have to all urine, urinate in front of the office, uh, in front of the officer, and while doing that, they have to they have to be, be beaten up as psychological torture, and again, as I'm mentally in control of you. Ibrahim's sister Fatima was also arrested by the Egyptian military, but she was released on bail a few months later and returned to Ireland. Once home, she began campaigning and lobbying tirelessly to free her younger brother Ibrahim. It was a long process, it was a long four years. Um, the campaign at the start was quite slow and it gradually built up and built up. Um, the, I think in a way 
it was just it was really hard because as well it's something that's so close to home and when you're campaigning for that it it's sometimes you know you you all you want your privacy but at the same time you can't have that because it's something that you need to make public and you need to show the injustice that has occurred and especially because it's someone that's quite dear to you and you know ultimately Ibrahim's our younger brother and there's been so many injustice that has happened that's happening to so many other people that at some stage you do ha you do wonder that and you do think what if Ibrahim doesn't get out you know and throughout the process there's been a lot of help a lot of people who've backed bone and gave us that support they've been the backbone of the campaign you know and whenever we lose that hope they'll push us towards it especially you know the Irish community have been great um, you know everyone has been great so it's, it was great to have that support and that kindness allowed us to keep continuing on even when we as a family lost that hope. What's your message to families of other political prisoners uh, in Egypt and around the world? I think I know it's the hardest thing to ever go through when you when you find someone loved and you feel trapped and unable to do anything but I think the ultimate message that and it's really important is to never give up and to keep pushing through because if I think what what they want you to do or what the regime's aim is to do is to allow you to break apart but what's really important is to keep pushing and keep you know keep go through the journey. It's the hardest journey, one of the hardest journey anyone could endure. But at the end, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And you know, for us, even though it was a long four years process, we saw that light. And I'm sure for so many others, they will ultimately see that. Tell me the type of people that you shared cells with. You get all the, in prison, you get all diverse diverse people. You there was a point where you were in, in the same cell as uh, some of our colleagues, some of the Al Jazeera journalists yeah, who were incarcerated. I was with, I was with uh, Beher, of course, P Peter Greste. Um, I was with them for, for a long time. And then I was with other journalists, Abdullah Fakhrani, uh, Samhi. So I was, I was, I've seen diverse people. You've seen journalists, doctors, uh, presidential uh, consultants, um, you know, some of the presidential team, some of, uh, a lot political a lot up to a normal citizen who who's basically who could who could be a farmer a normal day worker we could call what was the most difficult experience uh, or scenario that you you endured uh, in your time in jail i was beaten in front of my mom because i wanted an an extra she heard a rumor because in prison the visits every week so for her to hear something about me and want to check up on me she'd visit me that week and then she can't be able to hear anything or know anything about me for the next week so she heard a rumor about me so she came uh, a week later to hear am I okay she heard I had something was going on with with my brain uh, that I was uh, you know I was in hospital my brain wasn't functioning well so uh, she asked for two minutes extra. I was getting five minutes visit with wire and a meter, a meter between me and my mom and then wire at her side. And, you know, she has to scream and tell me what's wrong. And you have guards listening to your story, guards interrupting you. So your five minutes is basically gone and you saying nothing. So she wanted two extra minutes. And I was like, why are you crying, mom? And I held onto the bar and they were dragging me. And while they were dragging me, they beat me up and I lost conscious and I woke up in the hospital. But then after that, not by far, I had the trial that was meant to be my sentence trial. And then it was uh, it was in June 2015 and I was postponed. So when I was postponed, I was like, OK, this is definitely not going to end. And my mom is my mom feels bad. I feel bad. My whole family feel bad. I haven't seen my dad or, or sisters for four years or family, because if they come to Egypt, they will definitely be arrested. They, my sisters were later released on bail. So if they came back to Egypt, they would have been arrested. At that moment, my hardest moment was is prison really going to end? Am I going to stay here for, for the rest of my life? Am I, is this going to be my life? And it's basically you have to live in a prison environment at the end of the day could turn into a jungle where you have to survive basically oppression. You have to survive on your own. You have to survive any condition that can be thrown at you. After that, my mom got cancer. So I was like, I have to be released. If I'm not released right now, something will definitely happen to me because she's far away in Ireland. She went back to Ireland. She had to get treatment. I was in prison. I didn't know what was going on in Ireland. I had no way in contact with them at the moment, at that time. So I was very, very worried about my mom. What kind of toll does that take on, on you, when you're thinking about it now? I mean, you're you're relaying these stories, but at the time, how, how do you get through just a normal day? I I will be honest with you that suicide crossed my mind, but I I just I had to push through it because. I tried, I tried to fight, fight myself and tried to fight the anger that was in me and because I was seeing the better side of, of humanity.
why did it take so long for the Irish government to secure your release? There was other foreigners uh, who were released before. There was the American uh, citizen Muhammad Sultan um, and uh, and other dual nationals or or just foreigners who were released. Why why did it take four years mm -hmm. to secure your release? The prime minister here, I the fear he didn't pr pressure Egypt enough politically. But yet again, Ireland is is a small country. It's not as politically strong as Australia or America or or the other or Canada or any of the other countries. But yet I felt there could be more done. My sisters felt there could be more done. Um, Peter was released uh, because you know he had a lot of media pressure on him at the time with the 140 law. Yet they came to me and they said it doesn't apply to me. Even you know if you read the papers, it applied to me as it, as much as it applied to Peter. Later on, um, he, I'm in a mass trial. I was 494 uh, you know defendants in a trial. Uh, a lot of them were we were used. There's three big trials in Egypt: Al Fath, Raba, and uh, Al Nahda. So we felt that. Three, those three cases were using were used as political cards to pressurize the Muslim Brotherhood into giving up because they are such big cases and to release all of them would be would be a political game. So we felt there was many aspects to it. You couldn't only put one line and say this is why I wasn't released uh, because of that. But, but do you feel like the, the Irish government could have done more for you? I feel the Irish government could have done more at the very start but when the prime minister was changed then the government was changed I was released because my family worked very hard in the campaign they worked four years for a campaign as a sister starting on her own and then with the rest of my sisters and then my dad my mom the Irish people listening you know Lim Boylan MEP and my lawyer Dara Mackin Amnesty International Reprieve all of these you know gathering in at once so these organizing helping me was very effective with me at, the, at, at that time and especially through prison, it helped me psychologically a lot. But the pressure, yes, uh, yeah, that definitely, that definitely just needed a bit more. Now I'm going to go back to studying. But um, one of the things that sustained Ibrahim in jail were his memories of Ireland's beautiful landscape, especially this hilltop not far from where he went to school. This is where we meet his friends Anna and Peter, who waited four years to be reunited with their classmate. I thought it would be real awkward. I was like, I haven't seen this guy in four years. What do I say? What do you do? And but it was natural. Like when I saw him, it wasn't like a, he was gone for that long. It felt like it was just a weekend difference. Like you know, it felt like he was gone for a weekend when I saw him for the first time. Obviously, there's a lot of reporters there, which was a bit weird. <laughs> but uh, once once I saw him, everything was natural. Like it was okay. We went out for dinner after like a few days after that. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was natural. <laughs> Those four years, they're not like any four years. They're maybe probably the, some of the best four years of anybody's life mm -hmm. when you're growing up. And yeah. I mean, for you, how do you feel or how, do you, how did you imagine that it would have impacted on, on your friend? Oh, hugely. The things that have happened in four years, like I've done leaving sir I'm in the final year of college, even outside of education, like full driving license, things like that. Like just the things you go to from like the end of your teenage years to your adulthood and he's missed out on all that. So there's four years of like developing and like just living life that he's missed out on, which is awful to think of, like, you know. So there are things maybe that you would have taken for granted naturally, but absolutely, just mean so much more. Absolutely, like you can't put into like a sentence or like a quick conversation, four years worth of living, like developing, living and just doing things like, and he's missed out on this now, there's four years of prison. <laughs> But despite his suffering, Ibrahim insists his time in jail made him stronger. Despite the darkest of moments and the torture, he gained something invaluable in the process. I look at the bright side of it, that yes, if I didn't go to prison, I wouldn't have seen all the torture that happens. I wouldn't have seen all the you know, violation to human rights that's happening in Egypt. I wouldn't have understood all of that in a in 100 years if you, if you were to give me it. So for me to be able to gain that experience was very helpful for me. Tell us, what, what, what are you trying to do in order to get back some sort of uh, uh, normal kind of aspect to your life? To sit with mom and have a laugh and have a smile. We haven't had that in so long. So that for me is a lot. My family are helping me cure with that a lot. Counseling, I will start get probably counseling because all the flashbacks that are, are happening with me, my GP just doesn't recommend it right now at the moment. But seeing my friends and going out and living freedom, yet a lot of the time I just think of the oppressed people I left behind. And that's what I think will never be solved within me until they are released. 
I've actually a lot of the time I go to the viewpoint um, up in the mountains to 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 cherish freedom because there's so much in life that I didn't cherish at the moment.